Hello, and welcome to Roma in Central and Eastern Europe, the legacy of racism, enslavement, and annihilation. This is the inaugural event of 3GNY's new series, More Than Six Million, a series exploring Nazi persecution beyond Jews. I am Anna Schumann-Gallegos, 3GNY board member and grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. It is my honor to welcome you to today's presentation. Welcome back to those of you who have seen our previous programming. And for those of you who are new, let me tell you a little bit about us. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and supporters. There's currently uh, founded in 2005 with a group of six, 3GNY's community is now over 5,000 and growing. We have held diverse programs of all sizes around the New York area and played a leading role in launching other 3G groups, including 3G DC, 3G NJ, and 3G Philly. And we are currently working to facilitate the formation and growth of other 3G groups. Our flagship educational initiative is We Do, short for We Educate. 3Gs are often the last living link to survivors and their stories. There's currently a roster of over 300 of us who have gone through the We Jews speaker training program. And thanks to the past year and a half of virtual classes, our newest speakers don't just come from New York, New Jersey, and DC, but from all over the world. Through We Do, we are actively combating the statistics that show a staggering lack of Holocaust education by educating diverse communities about the perils of intolerance. Studies have shown that those who receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with those who are different from them. They are more willing to challenge incorrect or biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. 3GNY does not solicit donations from schools, teachers, or students. We provide our programming to schools completely free and we aim to keep the cost to, of training to 3Gs as low as possible. You can help support our programming through a financial gift of any amount. This will go directly towards training more speakers, giving us the ability to reach more students. There's a link with ways to donate in the chat and we hope you'll consider making a gift. If you've already donated, thank you so much. Tonight's presentation is also supported by the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, rooted in the Jewish value of respect for all humanity. The Maltz Museum exists to stop hate. Currently on view at the Maltz Museum through February 27th is the special exhibit, Stories of Survival, Object, Image, Memory, featuring more than 60 never before seen objects brought to American, brought to America by survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides. See the link to their website in the chat for info on in-person or virtual tours. We'll be opening up for questions from everyone viewing at the end, so be sure to type any questions you have into the Q&A. And now let me introduce you to today's featured speaker. Dr. Julia M. White is an associate professor in the Department of Teaching and Leadership in the School of Education at Syracuse University. She directs the Intel interdisciplinary minor in atrocity studies and the practices of social justice and is the co-coordinator of the Specter Warren Fellowship for Future Educators, which brings students to the Holocaust Museum Houston for a week to engage in teaching about the Holocaust. Her research agenda includes special education policy at the national and international levels and inclusive education as a human right particularly related to Romani students in Central and Eastern Europe and students with significant disabilities. She is the recipient, recipient of two Fulbright Fellowships of the Slovak Republic. Her work has been cited in a European Court of Human Rights decision on the misdiagnosis of Romani students, and she has testified in regional courts in Hungary and the Slovak Republic. And now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Julia. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen here. So thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Dave Reckless and 3GNY for inviting me to give this talk. I very much appreciate your interest in Roma and I'm thrilled that this is the first of um, the more than 6 million series. So I acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral land Syracuse University now stands. 
And before I start, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I came to this work. Um, in 1999, I was a high school teacher at Hilton Head High School. And in 1999, I did a Fulbright teacher exchange in Jelena, a city in the Western part of the Slovak Republic near the Czech border. I arrived in August of 1999 and in early October, I saw in the news that there was a controversy about a wall that was being built in the Czech town of Usti nad Labem, um, past Prague near the German border. 80 police protected builders who in the middle of the night erected a two meter high and 65 meter long wall along Matichny Street in which town authorities built because of complaints that the Roman in this town were quote, noisy and unhygienic. They argued that this wall was a noise barrier and that it was a safety issue that would keep Roma children from running into the street. Additionally, they touted it as a urban renewal program. I'd never heard of Roma before I went to Slovakia. I taught English at a gymnasium of university prep secondary school. And my new colleagues warned me to quote, watch out for the black people, they'll steal from you. And they cautioned me to stay away from parts of town where they lived in since they were quote, lazy and dirty. I had taught special education in Washington, DC and general ed in South Carolina where most of my students were black and Slovakia had a very white population. So I was actually looking forward to a little diversity in my town. Um, what I discovered, black people meant Romani people who looked to me more like they were descended from South Asia rather than Africa. And by lazy, they meant that they were largely unemployed which I'll address later. But what I saw were really industrious people picking up recycling and cardboard and I'm sure the occasional stolen copper piping to sell. But mind you also, when I began to understand Slovak and I was riding the bus, I heard non-Romani people lamenting the fall of communism because they couldn't take building materials from construction sites anymore to build their own structures. So these photos are from Ustina Labem and people in Czechia and Slovakia were largely in favor of this, but the UN, the European Union, the European Roma Rights Center and others considered this a violation of human rights and demanded that it be torn down. Right after it was erected, activists in fact did tear it down, but it was immediately rebuilt. Finally, in November, 1999, the wall was dismantled under pressure from outside of the Czech Republic, which was in the process of accession to the European Union. So this was not the last wall to be built to create ghettos for Roma, for Roma residents. Um, while I was in Slovakia that year, I started researching Roma, their history, their positioning in Slovakia and Central Europe, and this is when I learned that most Romani children were considered to have intellectual disabilities and were mainly taught in special schools. In my walks in Jelena, I saw significant housing segregation. I noted that Roma were denied service in restaurants and bars. And when I walked past schoolyards, there were almost no Roma children there. When I came back to the US after a year in Slovakia, I taught special ed at Hilton Head High in a self-contained classroom for kids with learning disabilities and intellectual disabilities. It was then that I noticed that my students were black and brown while the students in the resource room and if anyone knows special education, that's a less restrictive environment you don't spend all day in a segregated class. Um, those students were white. Uh, the connections between Roma kids in Slovakia, black kids in the US who were labeled as, as disabled were too striking to ignore. So the next year I applied to the doc program at Syracuse University specifically because of their emphasis on special ed on inclusive education with the sole intent of doing my dissertation research on the experiences of Romani children in Slovakia. I spent the 2003-2004 school year in the eastern part of Slovakia immersed in schools documenting the experiences of Romani first graders and how they were subjected to racist treatment by teachers and how many of them were streamed into special education or were in segregated classrooms by the end of their um, primary schooling. So now I'd like to show you before I go on some of my favorite people in the world. Um, Nicholas and Lavra are on the left. Um, my experiences with them are not the focus of this presentation, but Lavra, the girl in the green shirt, was a small child but an absolute force of nature. The way she resisted how teachers continuously disregarded her ability, her fierce advocacy, advocacy of Nicholas, who was in fact sent to a special education school after the first grade blew me away daily. This was the favorite thing I got to do was sitting in class with her. And Nicholas who was relegated along with the other Roma children to the back of the classroom, ignored daily by his teacher, constantly told by her how stupid he was. He also resisted by never listening to her, asking his peers for help since it was never given by the teachers. And the photo on the right are Yanka and Patrick. This was taken on the last day of school. When children are given their final marks and there's a celebration, teachers receive flowers and gifts, there are speeches, congratulations to the graduates and those who move up a grade. 
I went back to the school a few years later and Nicholas and Patrick had been placed in a special school and Lavra and Yanka, along with the other Romani children had been in a relatively integrated first grade classroom, even if the kids were assigned seats in the back of the room. Now they were in a segregated fourth grade classroom separate from their quote white peers. So even after everything she had been through, Yanka still wanted to be a teacher. She's probably 23 or 24 now. And I hope that I can return to this village and see if she in fact it is or whatever happened to her and Lavra. So now I'll go into the history of Roma in Europe. You can see the path of Romani migration from India to Europe, Africa, and the Americas. But first, a few statistics. There are approximately 12 million Roma in Europe, but it's difficult to get a complete count due to both data privacy laws and the fact that not all Roma want to identify as such for a census. About 2 million Roma live in Romania, 500,000 each in Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Hungary. The vast majority of Roma live in poverty, and it's estimated that about one quarter live in segregated settlements. Unemployment is high in Roma communities with over 50% in Slovakia, 40% in the Czech Republic, but in some rural areas, the unemployment rate might be 100%. Fewer than half of Romani children complete primary school. Most do not complete upper secondary or vocational schools, and only about 1% goes on to tertiary education. Over 45% attend segregated classes where all students in the class are Roma. Romani children are overwhelmingly uh, overrepresented in special ed due to factors such as racism, discrimination, in which teachers ignore or abuse Roma children and don't teach them, poor assessment practices, and children's difficulty with either the language of instruction or the language of assessment. So except for the first quote from the Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic after the Velvet Divorce, these are a few things that folks have said to me about Roma. So Vladimir Mechiar, former Prime Minister, he called students um, socially unadaptable and mentally retarded. And I say that word with great, uh, that's what he said. I hate that word. So um, a teacher in 1999, when I was there, watch out for them. They'll steal from you. Don't go to their part of town. Peter, in uh, 2002, when I was uh, collecting some data, he was an exchange student in Virginia. And he said, you can wash a Slovak gypsy, everything, he will stink, like it's his nature. And he goes on and on and on. They're the laziest, the laziest lazy you can find in Europe. And he raises his hand and leans back in his chair and says, but I'm not a racist. And then Dalibor, six years old, when I was doing my research, he sat in the back of the room and I often sat with him. Um, he was a non-Roma kid, and when um, the kids would have breaks, I had my, you know, data book, and kids would draw in it with my pencils, and, you know, it was, it was a great treat for me and for them, and he would say, now I have to clean my seat, um, and then a student that I taught when I was there in 1999, um, he was in law school now, and I saw him on the street one day, and he told me I was very brave to talk to them, and finally, there was a building manage, a building maintenance worker um, when I was back in 2014, and he mimed a um, machine gun and, you know, made the noise right, da, 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 and said Hitler had the right methodologies. So these are things that people said in the open to me about Roma when they found out what I was doing there. So there's no definitive timeline or history of how Roma migrated from India. However, the Romani di diaspora is generally accepted as having begun with migrations from India during the 10th or 11th century during wars with Persia. Either they were victims of war, served as metal workers, musicians, livestock handlers. They migrated through the Middle East to Eastern and Central Europe, then into Western Europe, and then into the Americas. One of the first accounts of, quote, gypsies, a pejorative word for, for Roma, derived from the erroneous belief that they came from um, Egypt. So Roma have been in Europe for almost a millennium, but they're still segregated and discriminated against, um, the most segregated and discriminated against people in Europe. So this document from 1830, uh, 1385 attests that the monarch of the Romanian province of Wallachia, quote, made a gift of 40 Roma households to the monastery of Tismana. Throughout the centuries, Roma were subjected to treatment similar to that experienced by enslaved uh, people in the Americas. This included punishments such as wearing a collar fitted with iron spikes. Like Africans in the Americas, Romani were born slaves. Every child born, born from a slave mother was a slave. Um, their quote unquote masters had, a power, had the power of life and death, death over them and they were property of the state. This is a Ro Romanian language poster from uh, 1852 advertising the sale of Romani slaves, which includes 18 men, 10 boys, seven women, and three girls. 
By 1856, slavery was abolished in Romania. However, there have been no reparations for enslavement. Meanwhile, in the um, neighboring Austro-Hungarian Empire, Maria Theresa set out four decrees to make Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, my computer just did something. So um, Maria Theresa set out four decrees to mandate the settlement of Roma to force them to give up their way of life. The first decree was in fact a ban on traveling to create quote, new citizens or new farmers. In 1857, Roma were forced to settle. They were denied the right to own horses and wagons in order to keep them from nomadizing. In the second decree, the term Sigani was, uh, was commonly used for the Roma at that time, was replaced with the terms new citizen, new farmer, new Hungarian, or new settler. They were supposed to give up their way of life altogether with their old name in order to accelerate the process of integration. In 1767, all Roma were ordered to register, and based on this registration, they were subject to conscription. The fourth decree issued in 1773 prohibited marriages between the Roma Mixed marriages were encouraged by uh, subsidies. Permission to get married, however, was dependent on swearing to live a proper and religious, or that is Catholic life. All Roma children over the age of five were taken away from their parents and handed over to Hungarian farmers' families so that they would grow up not knowing their backgrounds. So Ian Hancock has traced the history of Roma in German lands. In 1661, um, the elector imposed a penalty and Romanis found in his territory. Roma hunts were a means of exterminating Romani populations. In 1710, um, children were permanently placed with white families. All male Roma were, were uh, forced into labor. Women were whipped and branded. 1725, condemned Roma, um, 18 years or older, to be hanged. 200 Roma were arrested and tortured until they confessed to charges of cannibalism in 1782. 1830, again, another um, attempts of assimilation to remove children from their families to be placed with non-Romani families. Uh, another gypsy hunt for sport, which included about 260 in the list of kills, including a gypsy woman and her suckling baby, quote, were recorded in the hunt. Um, 1899, um, there was the Office of Fighting the Gypsy Nuisance to regulate the lives of Roma. Um, available historical documents relating to Roma began to be collected, particularly those containing to criminality. And then in 1920, German psychiatrist Carl Binding um, argued for the killing of those who are dead weight within human humanity. This included Roma. And the concept of worthless life became, worthless life became crucial to Nazis after uh, 1933. Then legislation requiring the, the, the photographing, photographing and fingerprinting of Roma was instituted in Prussia, where 8,000 Roma were processed in this way. Um, people were forbidden to travel in groups, to own firearms, and people without uh, proof of Bavarian birth were starting to be expelled from Germany. So what I'm going to do now is present part of a research project I'm working on. Um, this is the Americans in the Holocaust exhibit from the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum and it included the American press coverage of the events in Nazi Germany. I was curious as to how the US press talked about Roma during this time. So I reviewed five newspaper archives, the Atlanta Constitution, the Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, the New York Times and the Washington Post. I searched from January uh, 20, 1920 through December 31st, 1946 and any mention of um, for Gypsy or Romany in articles, editorials, cartoons, front page articles, military news, but I excluded things like um, Gypsy fashion, advertisements, Gypsy Smith, the, the even, uh, evangelist, Gypsy Rose Lee, anything that had parties, galas, and so forth with uh, Gypsy themes. So I'm going to show you the history of Roma um, during the Nazi era through some of these articles, but first a little context. The trope that um, 
Rome, a trope about Roma is that they are kidnappers, um, when in fact Roma have had their children taken away from them in the name of assimilation. In Nebraska in 1927, a blonde girl was taken from her Roma parents who were accused of kidnapping her. Blood tests showed in fact that she was Roma, not a kidnapped child. 86 years later, this little girl, Maria, was removed from her Roma family in Greece who were accused of kidnapping her. She is in fact Roma and she was not kidnapped. And this headline from the New York Times shows that this is not an isolated case, that the removal of Roma from their families happens worldwide. In fact, just last month, um, a court in Budapest ruled that the removal of Romani children by the state was in fact discrimination. So Roma have also been accused of being cannibals. This note from the New York Times in 1927 shows that Roma children have been put in separate schools because non-Roma Czechoslovak students refused to attend school with them due to their quote, cannibalistic proclivities. The parents declared that quote, their children were in danger of being eaten. Two years later, the press covered a case of Roma cannibalism. They were arrested for robbery and confessed to cannibalism. The trial was mentioned in the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. The accused were found not guilty, but of course they were accused of kidnapping a da uh, the daughter of a wealthy merchant. The stereotype about Roma as kidnappers, cannibals, and criminals, that alliteration is not on purpose, go back for centuries and continue to this day. This plays out in English idioms. When we feel that we've been cheated out of something, we might say he gypped me, which comes directly from the stereotype of Roma as thieves. So here's a timeline of actions related to Roma during the Nazi era. I'm gonna explore these more in depth, but I'd like to highlight a couple of things, a couple of these dates. In September of 1937, Dr. Adolf Wirth of the Racial Hygiene Research Unit stated that the gypsy question is a racial question for us today. In the same way that the National Socialist State has solved the Jewish question, it will also have to settle the gypsy question once and for all. The race biological research on gypsies is an unconditional prerequisite for the final solution of the gypsy question. <clears throat> and then in June of 1938, five months before the November program, there was Gypsy Cleanup Week in which hundreds of Roma throughout Germany and Austria were rounded up, beaten, and imprisoned. And this is actually the Woj ghetto where Roma were segregated even in the Woj ghetto, which I'll talk about later as well. <clears throat> so first Czechoslovakia, hearkening back to Maria Theresa and the Austro-Hungarian Empire's first, first and third decrees on forced settlement and compulsory conscription, <clears throat> Roma were granted full citizenship in July of 1928. But one of the consequences of that was that Roma were now required to serve in the military, one method of assimilation. Another consequence was that Roma were forbidden to travel and they were forced to settle. The local administration also began to force Roma to register. Forward to 1931, and we can see that another one of Maria Trace's policies is still in practice, the kidnapping of Romani children to be placed with non-Roma families. And the forced registration of Roma continues into 1931 and by 1933, Prague considered establishing reservations for Roma, similar what to the US has done to Native Americans. Similarly, in July of 1928, Hungary also passed laws forcing the settlement of Roma people. The New York Times and Chicago Tribune both um, reported that the Farzkali district would begin tattooing Roma in attempts to prevent wandering and to curb criminality. And finally, this shows how the bodies of Roma were policed by the state and the authorities. In 1935, Roma registered in the Sigled and in Sigled are forced to bathe. Roma were also subjected to forced sterilization under the Nazis with the 1933 law against the propagation of life unworthy of life. Romani women continue to be sterilized either forcibly or without their knowledge or consent, usually when they were in the hospital to give birth. And this happened until the mid 2000, uh, mid 2000, like 10, but it's, I'm sure still going on. But just this year, the Czech government has agreed to compensate hundreds of women who were forcibly sterilized. The US newspapers reported on the Nuremberg laws passed in September of 1935. The Los Angeles Times reported on the ban of marriages between Jews and Germans in December, noting that the ban also applied to Roma and black people in Germany. The Chicago Tribune reported in the use of German or related blood instead of Aryan and non-Aryan in the Nuremberg Laws. The article clarifies that related meant Europeans except Jews and Roma. And in 1937, soon after Adolf Wirth gave a speech on the total solution to the gypsy problem, quote, before the Racial Hygiene Research Unit, Dr. Rodenberg wrote an article in which he said that, quote, gypsies are biological parasites 
to whose destructive influence the racially pure body of our nation necessarily must act must react with degeneration. The racial hygiene uh, research unit traveled throughout Germany, registering Roma and Sinti, uh, Sinti or German Roma, documenting on whether they were cool or mixed race, taking blood samples, measuring their bodies to quote, scientifically prove that they were lesser people and predisposed to criminality. So anti-Semitic legislation in the Third Reich was also applied to Roma as seen in these articles. Um, Roma and Jews were not allowed in some public places such as this horse market in West Prussia. Roma bodies continued to be policed and regarded as criminals with the requirement that every birth, marriage or death of a Roma be reported to the criminal police. Roma had been rounded up in an interred and interred in concentration camps since the early 1930s. And this was also practiced in other countries under Nazi rule as seen, as this, as seen in this headline from France. In 1940, the deportation of Roma families from Germany to Poland began. In 1941, Roma from other occupied territories were deported. For example, over 5,000 Austrian Roma were deported to the Woj ghetto. And in 1940, uh, 1942, they were murdered at um, uh, Helmno. In 1941 also marked the beginning of mass shootings by the Einsatzgruppen. As in other countries under Nazi rule, Serbia forbade Roma to, partici to participate in any activities related to the press or the arts. And finally, by 1942, Roma were subject to the same restrictions of an anti-Semitic legis legislation as Jews. At the end of the war and after, the situation for Roma has not really improved, which I'll spend the next few minutes talking about. On May 16th, um, 1944, many of the 6,000 prisoners still alive in the family camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, knowing that they were targeted for killing, did not leave the barracks that day and tried to attack the guards that came in. They were then deported to other concentration camps, but the remaining 3,000 were murdered in the gas chambers on August 2nd. In 1947, Germany determined that all measures taken against Roma before 1943 were legitimate against persons committing criminal acts, not the result of racial prejudice. However, as of uh, 2006, Germans are paying reparations. There is some scholarly debate about the number of Roma who perished during the Poriemos, the low S, which is the devouring in Romani, um, and there are there's a whole discussion about what we should call the Roma Holocaust, but that's uh, not of the, under this, not the topic. Uh, the low estimate is 25% of the Roma population. The higher estimate is 70% of the Roma population. Possibly many more were shot in forests or fields where they lived where, and then were murdered in killing centers. And Father Dubois and Yahad in Unum continue to examine new data, researching and gathering testimony of perpetrators, survivors, and witnesses on mass shootings and undocumented Roma killing centers. What we do know is that the Roma middle class was largely annihilated. And yet again, Roma were subjected to forced um, settlement legislation. Under communism, there was universal work and education, although the levels for Roma were low. And it wasn't until 1981 that Germany officially recognized that Roma were persecuted by the Nazis. And then, um, in the 1970s through around 2010, we talked about forced sterilization already. After 1989, Roma lost low skilled jobs as cooperative farms were dismantled. Lower levels of education didn't necessarily impede employment under socialist anti-parasite laws, but it did impede job market prospects in the new economy. The transition to the um, open market was difficult for Central Europe and Roma were blamed as a drain on the welfare, on the social welfare system. Members of Romani communities marginalized before socialism and marginally assimilated during socialism became even more marginalized after socialism. As they became victims of new privatization and land restitution initiatives, they owned no land before 1989, they received no land after, and the majority of Roma lost their jobs as the former socialist apparatchiks who assumed power in the new democracy dismantled Slovak industry and broke down and redistributed cooperative farms. So it wasn't until 2015 that the EU recognized the Roma Holocaust. And to this day, um, uh, last year, I believe it was when the UN had um, speakers for uh, International Holocaust Day, I can't remember exactly what the term is, but no Roma were invited. 
And in 2018, the last pigs left Leti. And what Leti is, it was a concentration camp for Roma, mainly leaving from Terezin to Auschwitz. And this was a holding place for them. Um, horrendous, uh, horrendous um, conditions there. They're still finding, you know, things in the marshes, etc. But after the war, it became a pig processing plant and, um, in and until 2018. And there were protests and protests. Finally, the state um, stopped the pig, you know, the end of the pig processing there. And there was a competition last year. So there is going to be a memorial site here and they've chosen the um, winning design. And so that's going to be built if it's not already in progress. So ongoing issues, no one is in block 13. If you've been to Auschwitz, you've probably not been to block 13. That is the Roma block. And um, I've been there entirely too many times. I've been there four times. And each time um, the guide who would walk with a group of students I was with um, would just walk right by it. And of course I make them go into block 13 and they tell me we don't have time. That's not on our agenda because we don't have time to go through it. So um, people continue, if you go into block 13, it's probably going to be empty. So skinhead attacks have increased since the 1990s, along with a rise in right-wing in right -wing parties in Central and Eastern Europe. And children are segregated in schools more than ever. Um, the decade of Roma inclusion was 2005 through 2015, and arguably things got worse for Roma during that time. Um, and it's... I think directly related to the rise in um, right-wing parties and the rise in racist and discrimination, discriminatory actions in Central Europe. So in the early 20th century, legislation was passed that mandated that Romani residences be at least two kilometers from the main road. This legislation contributed to the establishments of settlements in which over one quarter of the Slovak Roma population live today. But there are Roma settlements all over Europe. Um, this is Lunik 9. It's a massive housing estate in the eastern part of Slovakia in Kosice. It was built during socialism. It's like a little city. Both Roma and non-Roma lived in Lunik 9. Starting in the late 1970s, more and more Roma moved, non-Roma moved away. In 1981, the city of Kashitsa adopted a, quote, concept for solving the questions of gypsy inhabitants for 1981 through 1985. The same was not only to empty the historical core of the city of residence so that it could be reconstructed, but also to acquire what were often potentially lucrative buildings in the city center while solving the, quote, housing problem of Roma families. Roma were then moved to Lunik 9. 220 flats were set aside for Romani tenants. A preschool, a medical clinic, a library, a cultural center, an office of the Commission Secretariat of the National Council for Roma Citizens was established there, and spaces for the National Security Corps and the Municipal Public Inspectorate were established to create conditions for, quote, impacting the education and re-education of inhabitants of gypsy origin. So between 1981 and 1989, the housing estate was characterized by a high concentration of Roma. Of the approximately 2,000 inhabitants, Roma accounted for about half. By 1995, almost all Roma from the center of Kashitsa were located or relocated to Lunik 9 on the basis of, quote, the housing concept for rent defaulters, homeless people, and inadaptable citizens that was adopted by the city council. And a literal wall was built around the housing estate. The resolution was signed by then Mayor Rudolf Schuster, who later became the Slovak president. There were no municipal services provided. Bus drivers received hazard pay. No garbage, uh, no garbage pickup. Ambulances refused to come to Lunik 9. Cabs refused pickups and drop-offs. Water access was controlled by local government, often cutting the water off, as well as cutting off electricity, including the winter. There is 100% unemployment. So however, things are slowly improving. There's now a Roma mayor of Lunik 9. Garbage is now removed somewhat regularly. A camera system has been put in place to monitor safety and vandalism. And as you can see, cleaning, clearing garbage is one of the conditions that um, people have in order to receive public assistance. So mob violence and hate crimes against Roma are also on the rise across Europe. 
Romani people are experiencing, experiencing discrimination, displacement, violent assaults, and pogroms. They are also facing structural police brutality. The European Roma Rights Center has documented police forces colluding with far-right groups during pogroms, very similarly to the Proud Boys here, torturing Roma in custody, killing them in their own homes, and conducting raids on Roma majority areas. Italy has a history of burning Roma settlements. This is from the 2011 Turin fire. Ukrainian neo-fascist paramilitary groups co uh, cooperate with local authorities and post videos on social media documenting their quote cleansing operations with armed attacks on Roma camps where Roma are beaten and their homes set on fire, forcing Roma families to flee into the forests. In June of, 19, uh, of 2018, one such midnight attack near um, Kiev claimed the life of a 24 year old Roma man who was stabbed to death by masked assailants and four others were wounded, including a 10 year old boy. And then in March and April of 2019, there were a series of attacks against Roma on the outskirts of Paris. This modern day gypsy hunt was sparked by coordinated hoax reports on social media, alleging that Roma people in white vans were abducting children and were planning to rape them and sell their organs. So it's a little pizza gate in Paris. Finally, there is some resistance about this narrative about Roma. Central European University has a thriving Romani studies program. Roma activists, I see a couple on this call, are calling for reparations for Roma enslavement. There's a growing group of younger Roma who are attending university and becoming activists. Um, just today, an article was posted in the New York Times that talks about ethical issues on the collection, use, interpretation, and dissemination of gen genetic information from Roma, including data collected in during the Nazi era and the potential for Roma themselves to have oversight over their, uh, their own DNA. So it seems like there's a Henrietta Locks moment starting for the um, around Roma genetic information. Um, I know this has been a somewhat depressing historical overview, but this is the reality of many, many Roma. And the more people that are aware of this racism and human rights abuses, the more that people, um, the sooner that these can be addressed. So I, this, is a, um, this is a photo I took of a um, billboard in Slovakia when I was there. This is a white brain, a black brain, a Roma brain, and a racist brain. And then this is a poster from People Against Racism. Um, and it's, this is from 1999, but it's, it's still very apt today, both in the United States and in uh, Europe with Roma on color convicted from birth. So I thank you so much for your interest in this really pressing human rights in, uh, issue and I look forward to conversation. Shop, stop sharing my screen, okay. Wow, that was incredibly powerful. And I think I speak for everybody watching when I say we have a whole lot to take in and and a lot to learn. I mean, I, I, I know so little about the Roma experience and I really feel like after this, um, I need to, to really dive in more because there are so many similarities mm -hmm. between the Jewish and the Roma experience in, uh, in, in Europe. Yeah. Um, so let's just start in with um, a couple of questions. Now there are a couple of people that wanted to know more about um, what went on in Auschwitz? Um, are there any notable differences between Block 13 and the other barracks? Um, so can you speak more to a little bit to the Roma experience in Auschwitz? Well, the, the thing with Block 13 is that um, the way that Auschwitz is organized now, um, it, it's like a, a little mini museum of like the, the Dutch experience in Auschwitz. So Block 13 is, is um, relegated to Roma and it's just it's it's exhibits of pictures and stories so um it, but it's very often passed by in the service of going to other quote unquote more, more important blocks mm -hmm. yeah um what do you think of the article promoted by the Auschwitz Museum that says that the uprising didn't really happen on May 16th in 1944 um, I don't know the article. So okay. if somebody has a link, I will be thrilled to look at it. Okay. Um, I think before I get to the next questions that we have in there, I just 
where can we go to find more information? Um, do you have books that you could recommend or? Yes, um, there are some, um, there are some fictionalized accounts of um, experiences. So The Color of Smoke, Even Death is Afraid of Auschwitz. And then there's a pen anthology of gypsy writers called The Roads of the Roma. Um, Angus Fraser has written a book, uh, he, a few non-Roma have written histories of Roma, but they're considered to be um, okay texts. Angus Fraser wrote The Gypsies. Um, Louis Louvi wrote The Nazi Persecution of the Gypsies. Michael Stewart wrote The Time of the Gypsies. Toby Sonneman wrote um, Shared Sorrows, where he recounts the, like you said at the, at the end of my talk, the similarities between the Roma and the um, Jewish experience. And Mahai Surdu just wrote a book called Those Who Count that's based on data collection and analysis for, um, for Roma. So I can put those in the chat. Okay, and we'll also get them for you. So for anyone who wants to look any of that up, it'll be in the follow-up email that you get mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow. And definitely, I think going to the European Roma Rights Center website would be um, a great thing to do because they're, they're doing really, really, really good work on okay. Roma rights. So yeah. uh, what is actually being done with the research conducted from the 20s to the present? Um, there's a lot. Roma are actually the... Um, Thank you, Petra, for that. I, 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 I tried to avoid, um, actually, you know what, I'm going to take those. I tried to avoid books by non-Roma, um, but these are, you know, the history. So let's cross out Levy's book. Um, there's a lot of research on um, Roma the origins of Roma and, you know, that kind of tracing Roma from India to today and the different, you know, communities of Roma. So there, there's a lot of um, genetic work to, on, on tracing Roma. So there, there are just issues with that. Issues on, I think there was, um, the article talked about one study that went to a prison in Bulgaria and they identified people as Roma by their skin color. And so that's how they categorized mm -hmm. their, their blood, the blood samples that we gave. So um, yeah, uh, thank you. I'm gonna add that uh, Roma archive to the list as well. Um, oh, how did I forget Hancock? We are the Romani people. Oh my goodness gracious. That's the, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I'll send you this list that is uh, adapted from what's going on in the chat. Great. So there's just lot, yeah, there are just lots of issues with the uh, with the collection and use of Roma to, um, you know, trace their origins and you know connections that kind of thing. And when you're in, when you've gone to the Roma communities, how how do they feel? Do they want to be a part of greater society? What kind of changes are they advocating for? And and what do they want from us from the greater population? Well, I think to not be racist would be great. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's so much uh, put on like blaming the victim that, you know, it, it's, you know, do Roma want to be part of society? Well, I, I don't know if you'd want to be a society where you're literally constantly spit on and, you know, beaten and told that you're stupid as I sat through every single day when I was in, when I was in these classrooms. So I think that's a that's a difficult question. I think that if we, like for example, it's it's illegal to discriminate in employment. Like you can't. Um, it, this is from when I was over in, in Slovakia. You can't discriminate by employment. But what they ended up doing on job applications is they would write B or um, C. So they'd either B B was BLA, which was white, and C was Cherokee, which was black. So they didn't they coded the applications so that they would just throw away the, the applications that had Roma on it or black on it. So, you know, just, I, I don't know how to answer that because, you know, I, I, I am sure that people would like to <laughs> be part of society, but society doesn't want them to be part of it. So that's what has to change is um, we've really got to, rethink the ways that we 
talk about and treat Roma, especially in schools. You know, it's, it's still graduation from uh, primary school is really low for Roma kids. And um, yeah. What advocacy groups do you recommend that we, we investigate and help support? Well, the European Roma Rights Center, um, the Roma Archive, it is a really important one. Um, Margareta Mata Magda Matachi is at Harvard and it's the FVX Center. I will actually get that to you as well. Um, I can't remember the exact name of it, but Magda Matachi is doing really, really good work um, and her peers. So there, and oh, thank you very much. This is awesome. Um, so what I'm gonna do is go through the great comments in chat that people are putting in, um, in some links that I'll collect for you. But definitely the European Roma Rights Center um, that works with a lot of other organizations. So I've given testimony in Hungary and in Slovakia through the Roma Rights um, Center, but they work with attorneys and uh, including Roma attorneys to work on school desegregation cases or school discrimination cases, which is pretty much um, you know, my area. And looking at changing the ways that we assess students for intellectual disabilities. Like in Hungary, they use um, decades old tests and photocopies and they just don't follow protocols and you know, they don't build on relationships with children so that you know, kids don't care about the tests. Like most kids don't but uh, for, for uh, psychological assessments. And so they'll like try to make pretty things with blocks instead of doing what mm -hmm. they need to do, like putting them in order to quote, assess their quote unquote intelligence. So um, there are just so many issues with the ways that non-Roma treat and interact with Roma that, that are, that's the problem. Uh, a couple of people wanted to know um, if you you could know anything about the status of the Roma people in the U.S. currently. Yeah, I think there are about maybe a million Roma in the United States, and um, it it varies. There was actually a conference in Berkeley in I want to say the early two thousands that um, was was, um, was it 2011? No, it was before then, because I, was it? Um, maybe it was, um, but that was one of the first time that Roma in the US had gotten together. Um, so I think there's, I don't know like the status on solidarity among groups because there are so many different communities and, um, you know, a, a lot of Roma don't want to identify as Roma. So in the census, they want to identify. And um, as far as the US goes, I think that people are still fairly segregated. And um, I think sometimes it's self-segregation for, you know, the, the reasons of, you know, being discriminated against in, you know, in, in the public sphere. Um, I know that uh, still sometimes you hear on the news the gypsies are coming where, you know, they'll talk about groups that are going through town and, you know, committing crimes and things like that or, you know, so it, it's, it's an issue in the United States as well, this kind of uh, discrimination. Now there's a, a terminology question that somebody somebody asked, they asked, is use of the term Sagani considered appropriate or should they be called Roma or Romani? I think if you ask five people, you might get four different answers. Um, Petra, I, I think you, on Twitter, you've talked about this, um, that some people reclaim the word gypsy and some people you know, prefer Roma, some people, you know, just, the, I think the language is less important than how people are treated and thought about. Understood. Yeah, but as a non-Roma myself, I'm, I use the term Roma. I, I don't say the G word. And like, there's a group of um, people 
who are working there. It's, I can't remember the name of the college, but it's a university in North Dakota and they still have gypsy week. That's their homecoming week. And it's this big celebration and it's their, you know, they have the gypsy day parades and um, people have started a campaign, uh, Native American students there and students have started a campaign to change the name, to get rid of the term gypsy week. And the administration is balking and they, they don't want to do it. It's a tradition. They've done it forever. And people just don't realize how those, you know, stereotypes about Roma are, can, can really be dangerous and um, perpetuate stereotypes. Well, I think just like, uh, you know, Jewish tropes are so ingrained in society and racial tropes, so would be yep. Roma tropes. That, yep. that makes sense. People don't want to let go of what they're yep. comfortable with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Just going back a little bit um, to the camps, there's a couple questions about Auschwitz, but I, I think the question is better on camps as a whole. So were Roma given the same treatment as Jews in terms of slave labor or roll calls, um, food rations, were they tattooed as well? Um, yes, uh, yes, they were tattooed, but I don't think that the, the Nazis were as, um, diligent or for lack of a better word about keeping track. Um, so, but yeah, the, definitely they were tattooed in the Z uh, for Zagoner came before, um, before their numbers. And um, they were definitely subject to slave labor, uh, to uh, forced labor. And they were, you know, subjected to the gas chambers as well. Um, they did have um, in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, they were put in a family camp and there are different, um, like I, I was looking for the reason why, and I, I don't know the, um, the exact reason why, but some people have said that um, it was just easier to lump everyone together. And, and the, the conditions, and I think it was 23 barracks in um, section B of Birkenau. And apparently the conditions were horrific. Like if the conditions at Auschwitz-Birkenau were horrific in general, they were more horrific for the Roma kept in the family camps. So mm -hmm. they were actually, even though they weren't separated from families, the conditions that they lived in were even worse than the other inmates of the camp. Happy. Now, as far as discrimination goes now, are there, um, like Roma ethnic last names that make them more identifiable or do people just go by skin color? Yeah, I think I, I think in like the US, uh, the last name Lee is, uh, I don't, I don't want to say common, but um, I, so I, I don't know if there are particular last names, um, but people, people mainly go by skin color too. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, in the photos that you had when you were talking about um, kidnapped Roma children, it had little kids with their hair dyed that were naturally blonde. So is that, a, is that a cultural thing or is that something that maybe that they did so that it would look to an outsider that those are their children because they're blonde? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question to tell you the truth. Um, I know that Maria is, but let me go back to the photo. Oh, 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 cancel. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it could just be that particular family because it looks like this little, and I don't know if the kid's hair has dyed. He could just be, or he or she, the baby could just be like a super, super redhead, but I don't well, know. There was a, there was a little girl and like the ends of her pigtails were like bright red, but she had like blonde um, roots. So I was... Do you mean the, the, the picture of, um, the one where she's just by herself? Yeah. Oh no, that was just uh, like darkish hair. It wasn't really red. Okay, all yeah. right. No, she's just, she's just got blonde hair. Okay. And it was in pigtails, but I think because of the way that they were, uh, you know, done, it just looks darker. And were there Roma kids that were raised by non-Roma who have written about their experience 
as educated adults? Do they know who they are, where they come from? I don't know the answer to that. And actually one of my students um, in the atrocity studies program that I direct, uh, she was doing her research on that and she, um, she doesn't, we couldn't find anything, but Petra, you've said yes, which would be, do you know of any work on Roma children who've been kidnapped in their experiences? Oh yeah, definitely other educated adults, absolutely. Um, but I don't know if folks have um, written about their experiences of being adopted out of, uh, do you mean adopted like forced adoption or um, people who were taken from their families and given to non-Roma families to be raised? Yeah, that, there's, that's... yeah there's, there's certainly, you know, Roma kids who are adopted kids, but um, sure. I don't I'm, know I, the forcibly removed. Yeah, I don't know if and if there have been any um, writing by people who are forcibly removed. My student couldn't find anything. Okay. Ah, okay, great. This is awesome. And just the last question we're going to ask is just about the history of the word, um, the term gypsy. Has it always been considered derogatory, or was there a point in time where it became a derogatory a slur? I think that it was, um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I haven't researched the term, but I, I do know that in like the 17th century, 18th century, um, I think that was a fairly commonly used term and it was a commonly used term, um, but it doesn't really, like they're not from Egypt. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, but it, it, it's just become a slur since, you know, in the modern era, I think. But, you know, the, the okay. way that, you know, people have been treated, you know, it's just in relation to that term throughout, throughout history. Understood. Yeah. Well, thank you, Julia, so much for speaking with us today. I think you gave us a lot of food for thought. And um, just as a reminder, tomorrow in the email, you'll be getting um, the list that Julia just rattled off really quickly of uh, uh, organizations that are um, working towards to changing the current Roma uh, situation with the Roma people, and as well as um, as resource resources to learn more. Yeah, and I want to thank Petra Gelbart for um, the the things in the chat. This has been fantastic. Um, if you have not yet made a gift to support our programming, namely the We Do We Educate program, we hope you'll consider making one now and you can refer to the chat for ways you can donate. And also if you have connections with educators who may want our speakers to present to their classes, please reach out. We have speakers ready to present either in person or virtually. And be sure to keep your eye out for an email as we continue on in the exploration into more than 6 million, a series exploring Nazi persecution beyond Jews. Thank you again to the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage for their support. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We are grateful as always for your support. Thank, thank you again. Good night.